Welcome to the shooting show. This week, Chris Dalton catches up with some essential roebuck management in southwest Scotland. Okay, this week we're up on one of the farms that I manage, close to the house actually in southwest Scotland. Um, uh, planted out with a mix of broadleaf and conifers. Um, the conifers have got away quite nicely, the broadleafs have had a, a bit of a battering. Um, we've not done much on it this year simply because of the situation. Uh, a lot of the recreational stalkers have not been up so we've had to concentrate on areas where there was restock and vulnerability. So essentially I've not really taken any books off. Um, I'd noticed on my sort of reckeys around there that there were there were two or three really quite nice books on there sort of would potentially make good animals but that's probably too many for the area so the deer management plan if you like we would always take a fairly high percentage of young books and then in and among them we would take some of the more mature and a few of the older animals out just so we've got a nice balance. Actually quite a nice, a nice morning really, a um, little bit of breeze, quite cold for the time of year, um, been very close to a, a ground frost early on, a bit, bit, bit of dew sort of as well after that kind of finished, that sort of lifted if you like, and we were pretty quickly, I mean the dog started indicating we were pretty quickly into a, into a doe, um, which was really in front of us so I didn't want to go thundering past it and have the thing barking off up to the right through the wood and, and possibly alert anything else that, that was in front of us so we actually stood for quite a while and just watched her um, as she got about her morning meandering and had a shake and it's quite always quite good to see the dog nice and steady um, Zosha can't quite understand why I'm not shooting any deer that's in front of us so she keeps kind of looking back at me and inching forward as if to say you know come on uh, what we're doing what we're playing at um, but eventually we, we kept pushing forward slowly, 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 let the dog work forward a little bit and the doe finally thought better of it and nice and quietly sort of ambled off really, ran off without uh, a great alarm call. I think one of the things when you're stalking and you know that you're actually stalking quite well is the fact that nature is, is going about its business and again you can see this quite nicely on the clip. You know, there's a buzzard kind of sat on a tree, there's the sort of birds are kind of singing and not giving the alarm call. You get the blackbird alarm call or the little wren that's sort of squawking at you as you're going past. But everything was kind of just going about its business. So we were just very, very slowly kind of tuned into our surroundings, just working up the valleys and up the glens, um, hoping to get into a deer, but primarily a deer that was not aware of us. That gives you a lot more option then when it comes to time to actually look at the deer, see what you've got in front of you, see whether it's an animal that you're going to take, get into a nice position to actually take the shot, uh, makes it an awful lot easier rather than the, the deer that you bump and quick ID on it, maybe it stops briefly for you and then it's a very, very sort of split second decision whether you actually shoot the animal or not. So if you can, if you can get into the, the nice stalking mode, um, it does make the job um, easier.
One thing I always think is quite nice is how nature adapts to, to man. Um, we're stalking fairly close to a quarry and, and, a, and there's a river bank as you'll see the river sort of runs just on the boundary of the, of the, the, the land, the, the march is the boundary for quite a bit of it. But just across from it is a big quarry uh, and the spoil, the dust is piled up in, in big heaps and the sand mountains have, have actually made the nest in there. They've, they've nested and now they've moved. There's still some in the river bank, but the bulk of them now go into, the, into this bank and they've realised that predators can't get up it. It's very easy for them to work to make the nest holes uh, and they've adapted quite nicely to a, a quarry that's been around for sort of 200 years. So interesting how nature adapts quite rapidly to um, the effects of, of man's activity. It always pays you just to, to stand a while and have a look and glass and just sort of really, really look deep into the cover, uh, which we did. And I suppose I've probably been glassing, oh, I don't know, 15, 10, 15 minutes maybe, and, and a buck uh, appeared across the valley on our right. I think he'd been couched actually, um, just taking the opportunity to meander around his patch um, and nicely kind of walked started to walk towards us i suppose when we first saw the book he's maybe 350 yards away something like that and his route was taking him very nicely across us and would have brought him onto a, a bank below the mound that i actually got set up with the with a bipod to take the shot so really i was just tracking him and waiting letting him come into a, a nice a nice distance um, probably would have stopped for me to take the shot if he hadn't i would have probably barked at him to get him to stop um, and all went well till he came up against a, a, a few trees where he started marking and then he kind of deviated and started to work at the head off as if he's going up the bank away from us so at that point decision time do we actually take the shot or do we let him go um quite a long quite a long shot really but i've got every confidence now in the in the rifle the creedmoor round through the handle um used it on the range used it now a number of times out in the field so i'm more than happy that um, when I point the rifle in a particular direction, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to hit the deer. I ranged the deer so I knew exactly the distance that we were, were shooting at. Um, and you'll see the shot, we're actually shooting um, fairly steeply uphill, um, or quite a bit up, uphill. So um, the shot itself placed high, high heart, just kind of low shoulder if you like. You can see the strike uh, and the exit deer instantly, instantly dead really dropped on the spot. A few kicks and... Uh, so job done. Um, so that's all about having kit and confidence in the in the combination that you're actually using. Um, Leopold Optics on the rifle, um, I'm very, very happy with. Probably six point. Crash is a tote that hill. Good girl. One thing I will cover, because it has been commented on a bit, is um, classic uh, approaching your deer scenario uh, effectively is is the, the blink, the eyeball reaction test on the deer. But if you work in a dog like I do, I always let the dog go forward um, when I've got a deer shot. And when I can see the dog and, and I can see the deer in the open, um, dog, her natural reaction is to go and nip the deer around the haunches. That's what she does. She rag it a little bit. Um, so I don't actually do a blink and eyeball reaction test uh, if there is no reaction at that point. Because I think if a deer was showing any sign of life whatsoever with a German short head pointer um, on its backside and around its, uh, its saddle, then it's not actually uh, going to be alive. If clearly after I've called the dog off, and then there, there is any suspicion that the, the deer is not dead, then you would obviously follow that up with a second shot if need be. So you would back off and take your second shot uh, if there was any suspicion that the deer was, you know, was still alive um, after, the, after the approach. And I suppose it probably took us five or ten minutes to get to the deer as we sort of crossed the valley.
fortunately, nice drag downhill uh, to get to a tree where I got a suitable lateral branch to, to hang the deer up. And a lot of body weight on this deer. It was a struggle to lift it up, actually, and get it on the on the branch so I could do the suspended growlick. Um, with that, I always... Um, bleeding the deer immediately or as soon as possible is obviously key. Reduce the temperature, stop the bacterial growth is what we're, you know, we all need to be working to. Uh, but I always hock the deer. Um, get it up on the tree and then I bleed the deer from that position. Um, obviously the blood is draining down into the chest cavity so it makes the bleed much more effective. So a few seconds um, while you're waiting just to just to hang the deer up uh, rather than bleeding it on the ground I think pays because of the effectiveness of the bleed but you're actually literally only delaying by 15 seconds anyway so deer is hung up in the tree, blood's draining down and then you get a really effective thoracic bleed gravity's taking effect if you like and the blood is actually going in the uh, in a downward direction which makes it a lot easier than if you're actually trying to do it on the floor uh, and then after I do a full growlick on the tree as you'll see and then after that it's uh, quickly into the the apex uh, row sack and then I can carry that down the valley really down to the farm track uh, so it's an all downhill from this point which was nice and then collect the car and um, recover the deer. Well, that's it for this week. Thanks for watching. Please like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and do ring that bell for more videos. And you know the drill. If you're not a member of Basque, it's time to join now. Basque, looking after your sport, looking after you. This has been The Shooting Show.